Good evening and welcome to the New York Symposium with Diane Sayre. I'm Diane Sayre. Today is March 22nd. I am pre-recording the introduction by a couple of hours. Things are moving very fast, so that may make a difference. Uh, the world dynamic changed dramatically today with the announcement by Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov that what Russia is engaged in in Ukraine, they no longer consider a special military operation, but that they are now in a state of war. And they have come to this decision due to the intervention by the West, perhaps the most provocative is the discussion by the French of potentially sending troops to Ukraine, and we've heard reports of 2,000 troops, 20,000 troops, 60,000 troops. Whether it is a bluff or not is hard to say. It doesn't really matter because Putin made very clear that this was a red line and the pompous idiots in the West say, oh, Putin is just bluffing. Who cares about red lines? Uh, it's a very dangerous situation. And then Late this evening in Moscow, there was a terrorist attack on a major theater outside the city. I think it holds 13,000 people. It's very large. Multiple gunmen entered. They killed 40 people. 100 people are wounded. A bomb went off. It's still not clear the damage, wounded, missing, etc. And I personally would like to express my condolences to the Russian people. Such acts of terrorism are absolutely devastating, uh, difficult, and I think your nation has reason uh, to feel very much under attack since President Biden has stated repeatedly that his intention is, in effect, to destroy Russia. So this ratchets up the danger, the march toward nuclear war and the urgent necessity of my campaign and the actions we must take. On other news, uh, the United States introduced what was probably correctly perceived as a sham resolution for a ceasefire, which did not pass, was vetoed by Russia and China. And China said, I think correctly, they didn't think the United States was sincere. After all, what kind of ceasefire is it if you say you can't have a ceasefire until we have our ceasefire the way we want it? And the UN um, Relief Works Agency is still not being funded by the United States, the one agency that would be capable of moving the massive amounts of humanitarian aid that are urgently needed in Gaza. Also, uh, Sudan is threatened with famine. South Sudan has 18 million people who are facing famine. Uh, 760,000 children already uh, suffering from malnutrition. And there are warnings that 220,000 children could die of starvation in South Sudan in the coming weeks and months. There is starvation in Haiti. And I will tell you, it's been my position that if the United States would return to its revolutionary principles as being an anti-colonial, anti-British empire power for the good, there is not one of these problems I've just referenced that would not be soluble. So the American people really must stand up. Helga Zeplarouche has called for a full all-out mobilization against nuclear war, writing letters, protests, boycotts, everything that you can do, interventions on your congressmen, etc. Uh, we must pull the world back from the brink of the abyss. So you may say, given all of that, why would we have a discussion about the solar eclipse? Well, in moments like this, it is actually very urgent to remember where we are, who we are in the universe, the miracle of the human mind that is capable of apprehending certain universal principles which clearly affect bodies in space that are far greater than we can even reach. Uh, so I asked my longtime colleague, Roger Ham to talk to 
you tonight about the eclipse, the solar eclipse, which is coming up in New York and a big uh, band across the United States on Monday, April 8th. We'll be watching it here. Hopefully we'll all be still alive. And hopefully people can consider that perhaps there are principles that are larger and more powerful than the foolish squabbles that we've fallen into. So with that, Roger, why don't you take it away? Um, as Diane mentioned, there's going to be a solar eclipse on April 8th, uh, just a little over two weeks from now. And I definitely will discuss that but first, I wanted to more broadly discuss the question of the importance of astronomy in really defining who we are as a species and how that should affect our thinking. And I just wanted to start with this photograph, which um, hopefully people can see. This is called Earthrise. And it's a picture of the Earth taken on Christmas Eve of 1968 by the crew of Apollo 8, which was the first, the first time that human beings had ever orbited the moon. And every astronaut that's traveled to space, whether it's to the moon or to the space station or uh, anywhere else in space has really marveled at this image of the Earth, of a single planet in the, the vast darkness of space. There's no political boundaries. Uh, there's no, no divisions on the entire Earth. And that when thought of from that perspective, all of the petty squabbles that divide us and in the current situation potentially could destroy us all seem absolutely absurd. And it's always been the hope of, of many that the exploration of space could be a, a great opportunity for all of us acting on our common destiny. And to this day, we have Russian and American uh, astronauts on the space station, as well as people from many other nations around the world. So with that perspective, I just would like people to think about the fact that the stars and the planets have all been visible long before there was any human life on the earth. And so I think it's safe to say that it has played a very fundamental part in our culture and in all cult cultures around the world throughout human history. And the fact that if you go out at night and you just are patient and watch, you'll see what appears to be very uniform motion of the entire heavens around us, as if we were in the center of that universe and everything revolved around us. And that sort of sense perception led people like the Egyptian astronomer Claudius Ptolemy to develop a system based on that, that the heavens really consisted of these crystalline spheres, one sphere nested inside another, that somehow just uniformly rotated around the earth with uniform circular motion, uniform speed, uh, the earth being stationary, but that the heavens and whatever caused them to move were completely unknowable to, to mere human beings. And while this became complicated by when you start to look more closely at the motion of the planets in particular, which is a Greek word meaning wanderer, that the planets seem to wander against this background, this fixed background of stars. 
So they seem to have non-uniform motion. And then you had things like meteor showers. And I think, Jose, I think uh, perhaps our first graphic is of a meteor shower from 1833, which from all eyewitness accounts was a, a spectacular uh, meteor shower. It occurred in November of 1833. Yeah, there we have it. Now, this, this drawing looks rather exaggerated, but all the accounts are that there seem to be the shower of sparks coming down from the sky in all directions. Abraham Lincoln saw this meteor shower in 1833 when he was 24 years old. And he, of course, was a great lover of telling stories. And at one time in the midst of the Civil War in a cabinet meeting, he was asked if he really thought that the Union would survive. And he told this story from 1833 when he had rented a room from a, I think it was a Presbyterian minister. And at some point in the night, the minister came banging on the doors and told him to get up and come out and look because it was the end of the world. And Lincoln, in his cabinet meeting during the Civil War, said, well, the world didn't end then, and the Union will not end now. But events like the meteor shower clearly showed that the heavens could change. And it, 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 in fact, something like a, a meteor, an asteroid, would apparently penetrate uh, between these different shells that had been proposed to carry the different planets around the Earth. So already there were problems with this idea of this sort of fixed, unchanging, perfect, uh, heavenly motion. However, that theory of Ptolemy was considered the best theory of the heavens for 1,400 years which is rather extraordinary in the history of, of any ideas. And I think it was really because it was rooted in this sense perception. We don't feel the earth moving. It seems to be stationary and everything looks like it's going around us, so why not? A major advance over that theory came with Nicholas Copernicus in the in the the early 1500s, where he developed a system where the Earth rotated around the Sun. The Sun was at the center, and the Earth, along with all the other planets, rotated around the Sun. And that certainly simplified the picture of how all the planets moved but it was really no better at predicting where the planets would be than Ptolemy's theory was. And neither system could at all explain why the planets moved as they did. It just wasn't really a relevant question for them. And uh, someone who's really an extraordinary giant in the history of science, um, is Johannes Kepler, who lived uh, from 1571 to 1630. And if you think that astronomy is somehow untouched by the problems of the day, um, Kepler lived during the Thirty Years' War, which ripped Europe apart in religious warfare. And Kepler himself was forced to flee his home more than once because he refused to change his religious beliefs as these religious battle lines shifted back and forth across various countries in Europe. Kepler may be best known for his uh, so-called laws of planetary motion, the planets travel in ellipses, thing, things like that which are important, but the two principles that I want to focus on 
uh, that Kepler gave us was number one, he proved that the heavens were governed by order, by harmony and beauty. And that the motion of the planets is not arbitrary and that the solar system as a whole expresses the same harmonies that we experience in music, which is knowable to the mind of man. And the second point is that he showed that the heavens are both knowable and are governed by the very same laws that govern the physical world that we live in. You know, we, 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 when we take an object and we drop it, it seems to be it moves toward the earth. And Kepler explicitly states in his writings that if we were to take two objects in space, that they would be drawn toward each other. And this idea that the laws are the same on earth as in the heavens, that the fact that these earthly laws are coherent with the heavens is much the same idea that man is made in the image of the living God, that they are not two distinct worlds. And particularly in the sort of dangerous times that we live in today, where people seem capable of the most irrational and destructive actions, that that's a very powerful idea. And Helga, in her 10 principles, made that uh, the tenth principle that man is essentially good. So uh, that uh, that's a very powerful discovery in and of itself. Now, talking about the eclipse itself, on the afternoon of Monday, April 8th, the sun will disappear for millions of Americans in 15 states when the shadow of the moon passes overhead. This is what's called a solar eclipse, when the moon, the earth, and the sun are precisely aligned in the sky. And Jose, if you can, uh, if you can find one of the, the diagrams, it's fairly far down. Well, this is, this is, uh, in Hindu mythology, it was believed that a god actually swallowed the sun. That's what caused an eclipse. And this undoubtedly caused real panic um, to many when it, it just suddenly uh, disappeared or the moon gradually moved. Some dark uh, sphere gradually uh, stole the sun. And there's a report from Herodotus about uh, some war, I forget the particulars, where a solar eclipse occurred in the middle of a battle and both sides were so startled by this that they decided that maybe they should make peace. We can only hope that the eclipse on uh, April 8th has the same effect on some of, some of our world leaders today. Um, there's there's a diagram further down, Jose, if you can find it, that just shows the position of the, well, okay, this is fine. A solar eclipse occurs when the moon is in between the earth and the sun. And because the earth's orbit is tilted relative to the orbit of the earth around the sun, most of the time when the moon is in this position, it's too high or too low to cast its small shadow onto the surface of the earth. So I think it's roughly between two and five times a year that you have the moon's shadow lands somewhere on the surface of the earth. And there are people who chase eclipses who will fly most anywhere in the world for the opportunity to both experience um, a solar eclipse 
and to actually conduct experiments during the, the few minutes when uh, the light of the sun is obscured by the moon. Um, and there are other times if the moon is on the opposite side of the earth, then the earth's shadow can fall on the moon. That's called a lunar eclipse. And because the Earth's shadow is not, uh, it doesn't completely block out all of the light from the sun, the moon will become very dim and often will become reddish because everywhere on the circumference of the Earth where it is sunset, um, the colorful sunset uh, that we see on the earth uh, will be carried over to the surface of the moon. So it often will look reddish. Okay, now um, if, we, uh, if we go back up to the top, I'll try to keep, keep more in sync with some of these pictures. Okay, now this is a very a famous statue in Prague, uh, which I was able to visit in 2016. It's a statue on the left is Tuko Brahe, who is a Danish astronomer, who, uh, uh, and on the right is Johannes Kepler, and Kepler actually worked for Brahe for a period of time. And Brahe is best known for taking the most accurate measurements of the positions of the planets that had ever been accomplished before. And this provided crucial data for Kepler to disprove the earlier models and to actually develop a theory that not only more accurately described the motion of the planets, but actually uh, led him to address the question of the cause of the motion. Um, and just go down the next couple, the next couple slides. Okay, this is go back, go back up that one. Yeah. So that's me in Prague back in 2016 next to the statue. And I'm wearing the same t-shirt today that I was wearing that day which has a picture of Kepler and has this really wonderful quote from him. The diversity of the phenomena of nature is so great and the treasures hidden in the heavens so rich, precisely in order that the human mind shall never be lacking in fresh nourishment. So this was really a source of great joy to Kepler to be able to investigate, uh, really to investigate the thoughts of God. How, how was the universe created and how does it operate? Now, okay, go on uh, to the next slide. Okay, the next one. Okay, so... Now, this is an image of what the sun will look like at what's called the point of totality. That as the, uh, it's roughly a, a circular shadow of the moon will travel over the surface of the earth uh, in terms of the eclipse that we're going to see in about two weeks. It will start over Mexico, travel through Texas. I believe it goes pretty much right over Dallas. Up through the, the Midwest, it goes directly over Cleveland. In upstate New York, it will go directly over Buffalo and Watertown and eventually end um, up in Nova Scotia. And for observers on the ground, what you will see is that the round uh, uh, sphere of the moon, when you're looking in the sky, 
you'll see the sphere of the moon gradually move across the face of the sun and that will take that will take some time and at the point of totality the diameter of the moon is perfectly uh, sufficient to block out all of the light coming directly from the surface of the sun. And if you go down uh, again, this, this shows the path of the, uh, the, the black band will be the path of this uh, path of totality um, on April 8th. And the reason it's curved is because the surface of the Earth is curved. So the Earth is rotating, the Earth is moving, the Moon is moving, and the result is the shadow which takes this curved path. The next diagram. Okay, and again, these, these are just diagrams to help you visualize what's actually occurring to make to make these shadows to make these events occur um okay the next one please okay and this is this is a really nice picture um the light that you see is not coming from the surface of the sun it's coming from the sun's atmosphere, which is called the corona. And I think if you look very closely, there are a couple spots where you can see bright, uh, brighter areas uh, right near the surface. You can have uh, solar flares where you can have millions of tons of, of, of matter, of hydrogen, and helium being thrown off from the sun. And the corona is one of the most interesting, I'll come to this a little bit later in terms of some of the scientific research that is being done on the sun, on the corona, um, which is only visible during these brief minutes of totality. Depending on exactly where you are, you will see at most four, four and a half minutes of what's called totality. Um, so the moon will gradually, very slowly move across the face of the sun. There'll be this period of totality, and then it will continue moving away from the sun. And during these uh, brief minutes of totality, the sky will get dark. You may notice the temperature dropping because there's no sunlight. Um, the behavior of animals can change. Uh, there are reports of bees returning to their beehive because they think it's nighttime. Um, birds uh, going to the trees where they would roost uh, during the night. So every living creature um, is is sort of shocked um, uh, uh, by by these rare moments of totality. One of the big mysteries about the sun, which again can only be investigated right at this moment, right at this point of totality, is the visible surface of the sun, in spite of the fact in the core of the sun where you have the fusion reaction occurring, the temperature is millions of degrees Fahrenheit. That temperature gradually decreases as you go outward from the core of the sun out to the quote unquote surface. And <clears throat> The photosphere, which is considered the sort of the visible surface where most of the light is emitted, the temperature there is only about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. But you go, you know, uh, 
I don't know, tens of thousands of miles higher up into this corona that we're looking at now, and the temperature can be two to three million degrees Fahrenheit. So a big question is, where does this energy come from? And that's one of the things. There'll be there'll be lots of big telescopes and uh, uh, around the world that will be looking at this to try to answer some of those questions. So I want to uh, just mention a couple eclipses in history. I mentioned this report of Herodotus about how a war may have been ended. Uh, because of a solar eclipse. In 1868, the element helium was discovered um, by the use of a spectrograph uh, looking at the corona of the sun, that they found the spectral lines for helium, and that helped to uh, under or helped to explain what was actually fueling the sun. Previously, people had said, well, maybe it's made of coal and that's what's burning. But, you know, it was it was pretty obvious that there was no no principle of combustion that could explain the enormous output of the sun over billions of years. And uh, in part because of the discovery of helium, they were able to arrive at the conclusion that, in fact, it was hydrogen being fused where helium was the end product along with the release of enormous amounts of energy. Um, Einstein developed his general theory of relativity in 1905, where he argued that gravity is not an attraction between objects, as Newton had described it but rather that the whole fabric of space-time was curved by the presence of large, massive objects. And so that objects which would uh, take a curved path, like a planet orbiting the sun, were actually going in a straight line, defined by the curvature of space-time caused by the mass of the sun. So that was his that was his theory. And one of the ways that this was to be tested was, well, what happens to the light of stars passing near the surface of the sun? Would that light, in fact, be curved if it is simply following a straight line path in this curved space time? So in 1914, they attempted an expedition to, I forget where it was, but somewhere in the world where there was going to be an eclipse. Uh, in the case of 1914, the expedition got called off because of a little thing called World War I. Um, sometimes these expeditions have traveled thousands of miles with heavy equipment. They've set up and then it's so cloudy or rainy that uh, they couldn't get any useful information. In 1919, Arthur Eddington organized expeditions to the coast of West Africa and Brazil, both of which were going to be in the path of totality of the uh, solar eclipse of 1919. And they set up their telescopes. And one thing which we may be able to observe on, on uh, April 8th is because the light of the sun is blocked by the moon, some stars will become visible in the sky in the middle of the afternoon. So what they did was um, uh, uh, in 1919, it was a particularly good chance for this observation because there were a number of bright stars that were in the same area of the sky as the sun. And so they knew the precise location of those stars from previous mapping of the skies. So then they looked during this point of totality 
and looked at where the stars seem to be uh, in the sky at that moment. And Jose, if you'll go down to that image of, uh, of the apparent position of the stars, I think it's labeled something uh, about Einstein. While he's getting that slide, what, what they found was that, yes, in fact, the light from these bright stars was actually bent when it passed near the mass of the sun so that where the apparent position of those stars was, was further away from the sun than we knew them to be. And Jose, can you find that slide? It's sort of counterintuitive when you think of the light being bent. Um, you might think that it was it was moving the position of the stars in the other direction, but it made the stars look like they were further away from the sun than they actually were. So this was a, a huge discovery which confirmed Einstein's general theory of relativity. One headline, I think this was in the New York Times, lights all askew in the heavens. And Einstein, who prior to that point had really only been known to physicists, he suddenly became an international celebrity and you know, was known by people all over the world. So as for the, the eclipse um, itself, um, you should go outside and get to know the sky, and you should do this now. This is not just something to do on, you know, April 8th in the afternoon to run outside and try to get a quick look at the sun. You should, you should find out when does the moon rise, when does it set, and how that changes over the next two weeks. How the degree of illumination, everybody knows that sometimes the moon is a sliver, and at some points we have a full moon. Well, when you have a solar eclipse, because the moon is gonna be in exactly the same direction as the sun, none of the, the face of the moon you know, that we see will be illuminated. They call, it's called a new moon. So the best way to appreciate what's happening during the eclipse is to get to know the sky, get to know how it changes from day to day. This is something that I think we've become very disconnected from, especially living in big cities where the sky is always bright and you can never see much of anything. And imagine yourself floating in space millions of miles above our solar system to try to visualize the geometry about how this eclipse is going to come, come together. Where the moon currently is in its orbit around the earth, at what position it will uh, it will directly intercede between the sun and the earth and how how uh, how the eclipse itself is generated for anybody who is able to go do it don't miss it if you have the chance the path of totality is only about a hundred miles wide and because the shadow of the moon is a circle. If you are right in the center, you will experience the longest period of time of darkness. If you're off center, then the shadow is going to go past your position much more quickly. So you may only see a minute or two minutes of darkness. So 
go online. There's tons of information from NASA, from astronomy sites, from other space-oriented websites, which have lots and lots of information about the, the exact path of the totality and the timing of this. It'll be in the afternoon. I think the uh, it will it will hit uh, Texas sometime around two thirty Eastern Daylight Time, and around three twenty Eastern Daylight Time in Buffalo. So the the whole event from start to finish will take much longer. And, and the point of totality is certainly the highlight of that. Um, but there's a lot to be a lot to be seen and appreciated during the partial eclipse when the moon is only uh, covering a portion of, of the sun. To be very safe about this, you should never ever look at the sun with the naked eye and certainly not with binoculars or a telescope. There are solar filters which are available for telescopes or binoculars that filter out the harmful wavelengths of light and they make eclipse glasses. They're usually made out of cardboard. They're cheap. You can get them for about $2 a piece online, which you can wear at any time, you could go out today if the sun were shining, it's raining here, but you could go out today with eclipse glasses and you can safely look at the sun, which is interesting to do. So the eclipse glasses should be worn at all times except those few minutes of totality when the moon is blocking out the light from the sun. During those few minutes, it is safe to take off the glasses and look directly at the sun. You can also construct a pinhole camera out of a cardboard box. The idea being that if you put a, a very tiny pinhole in one end of the box, preferably just a, a piece of aluminum foil, there we go, um, if you cut a, cut a hole in the box at the end and put a piece of aluminum foil there and just make a very tiny hole with a pin, that the light from the sun will uh, travel through that pinhole and be reflected onto a piece of paper on the back side of your cardboard box. So that's another safe way that you can observe all uh, aspects of the eclipse. And during the periods of partial eclipse, um, there's a lot to be seen then as well. If you, if again, if 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 you go online, if you investigate this, that there are temperature changes. Sometimes there's a cool breeze that's created by cold air running down uh, from the sides of of mountains. Um, animal behavior changes your perception of color changes as it gets darker. So uh, one site recommended that people wear green and red clothes so they could actually look at that. There are a number of other things that, that can be done, but um, I would just urge people, uh, for me, this is probably the last time in my lifetime I'll have a chance to see a total eclipse and hopefully the weather will cooperate. Um, there's, a, there's, if you can determine that the local weather is bad, some people will hop in a car and try to drive 50 miles east or west and uh, try to find a clear patch of sky. So there's, there are things you can do to try to increase your odds of, of, of observing it. And I highly recommend that people do so. So thank you.